Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, a show about weirdos, with your hosts, John Fahey, Aaron Peter, and Matt Brousseau. Hello folks, welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, it's a show about weirdos, doggone it. My name is John Boy, I'm your host, John Francis Fahey, joining me as ever is Cock Holiday. That's pretty good. He's pretty good. <laughs> I'm your cuckleberry. Yeah. And to my straight, mm-hmm. you're yeah, not. Gay. Yeah. <laughs> you're straight. To my straight, and you're gay. <laughs> Why <Wyatt> twerp? <laughs> hey, ah. nice, 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 nice. Straight from the bottom. How you boys doing? Bottom. That's Aaron Joseph Pita and handsome Matt Brousseau. Oh hi. Mm-hmm. Here I am. Mm-hmm. Here you are. We're at the top of our form, boys. Mm-hmm. Truth, that's fantastic. No. Get ready. We're bringing the thunder. Yeah. Bring your A game. Bring your A game. Yeah, we're going to Vince McMahon this thing. Oh, oh no. God. Boy, did you guys read that stuff? Who yeah. would have guessed? Dude, what's with his look now? Oh, I know. With that's that, the real with crime. that, like, painted on Dude, Fu Manchu. Dude, looks like a telenovela star. Yeah, He's fucking yeah. 100 years old, oh. jet black hair, yeah. Yeah. and, a, like, the pencil fucking... One month in Saudi Arabia, and he's just... Dude, what is... We're going to have to talk about that another time. I mean, you There's know... There's a lot. We'll save on. it for the Patreon, which yeah. uh, we just did one. Mm-hmm. Extra episode per week, folks. $5 a month. I mean, mm. it's really wow. just a... For sweet. the price of a latte. <laughs> We talked about uh, uh, on the recent one about uh, the drunk Andrew Johnson mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh, some porno and uh, what else did we get into? Some other stuff. The bat- yeah, oh. Listen to it to find out. The yeah, ba- yeah, the yeah. Batman's. Yes. Batman's. Yeah. Oh, right. Lex uh, Luthor. Uh, yeah, Batman's pon- penchant. penchant mm-hmm. Yes. For Chipotle. Mm-hmm. Yes. And the Lex Luthor files. Yeah. yeah. And eating box during menstruation, which is very important mm-hmm. to me yeah. mm-hmm. and really the world. Yes, to mm-hmm. everyone. Get your iron. Uh, Get your eye game. F E mm. on the periodic table. Period. What? Still period. You you were right, John. We really are at the top of our game. Yeah, this is the best it's ever been. <laughs> um, gentlemen. Yes, John. We here to talk about someone from Louisiana. 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 We're talking about the kingfish. The king fish? The king fish! Yeah. That's yeah. Huey Long. Okay. The governor. Okay. He the governor. All right. You in the governor's mansion now, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got a mope full of gators. A mope full a of- A moat. Oh, yeah, a mope. A mope full of gators? Get out of here. <laughs> this is a, uh, a historian, uh, one Courtney Vaughn. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Applied to this. Uh, this is meticulously researched by our beautiful friend Laura Crawford. Thank you, Laura. Thanks be to her. Um, I'll praise be to Allah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Quote: When the strong ignore the weak, there is always someone who hovers in the background, learning the techniques of demagoguery. Mm-hmm. Um, American politician Huey Pierce Long Jr. was born to Caledonia, Palestine, Tyson Long. And uh, Huey Pierce Long Sr. Caledonia, Palestine, Tyson. <sighs> mm-hmm. Wow. God, these people. August 30th, <laughs> these people. 1893. He was the seventh of nine living children. Uh, you know how it goes back then. Ghostly family. Yeah. They uh, raised livestock and they lived in a two-story farmhouse on 320 acres of land. In his later speeches, Huey would downsize the farmhouse and describe it as a log cabin. Uh-huh. Um... Winfield was the seat of Wynn Parish. Uh, counties are known as parishes in mm-hmm. Louisiana. Mm-hmm. It was a small town surrounded by pine forests. Uh, in 1893, it was one of the po- uh, Louisiana was one of the poorest states in the country. It still is today. Yes. Um, the uh, big time landowners and industrialists in New Orleans and Baton Rouge controlled what little wealth the state possessed. Um, the folks in Winfield, who were mostly Baptist. Grew to resent the Catholic elites downstate. Mm-hmm. Hmm, you don't say. Um, at the start of the Civil War, representatives from Winfield voted to stay in the Union because, according to them, quote, who wants to fight to keep the Negroes for the wealthy planters? Yeah, we want our own. Yeah. 
Uh, oh God! By the time he, I mean, it's one of those. It's backwards progressive. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Uh, by the time Huey came into, onto the scene, Winfield was a hotbed for populist politics. Populism is, of course, a range of political stances that emphasize the idea of the people and often juxtapose the group with the elite. Hmm. Um, Makes sense. That was a big thing, you know. Bannon said once, uh, Bernie was out. Mm-hmm. He was like, it's a thousand percent you're going to win. Yep. He's like, this election is going to be won by a populist. Yep. He's like, it's either, it was either going to be you or Bernie, mm-hmm. no matter what. Um, Winfield would vote for Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate for president in 1912. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was in jail at the time. I did not know that. Or was it 1918 he was in jail? Or 19, yeah. I have no fucking clue. So you, Eugene Deb got the, the most uh, uh, votes uh, of anybody in jail for president. Yeah. Yeah. Up until maybe this year. We'll mm-hmm. find out. Even though that other guy was getting everybody cigarettes. Mm-hmm. So America's economy was in the toilet in 1893. The panic of 1893 lasted for half the year, and there was a run on the currency. It's a panic um, The selling of assets caused the dollar to plummet. Uh, 158 national banks closed, and most of those just happened to be in the West and in the South. Businesses could not borrow from those banks, and they closed as well. What, what year was that? 1893. Now, I, I, I might... I, I, was this a railroad uh, bu- bubble burst? Or- uh, no, it was actually very tied to international. Interesting. Uh, it- South Africa, Australia played a part. I, I, I might have the year wrong, but um, the, one of the reasons we have um, the Federal Reserve is situations like this where the the country was... Uh, uh, Fine. Well, it, the, the economy was plummeting, and so all of the rich, uh, the super rich, the Vanderbilts and so yeah. on... The U.S. government asked them if they could bail out the country. Yeah. And so that was kind of the, there was this unspoken agreement of if you get so rich from our country, mm-hmm. it's your job oh, to help to us. Up, uh, mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, so, so it, it, the, the thoughtlessness of the current billionaire class maybe could be traced to the fact that they don't have to do that anymore. Right. Mm. And so much of this story is really going to show, uh, you know, that kind of juxtaposition mm-hmm. is, um, you know, the country was a place where, yes, you could get fabulously rich, but, yeah, you could outpower the government, mm-hmm. and um, you could certainly outpower the people. Yeah. And nothing uh, was insured by the government at all. No. Um, if anything happened to you, your, your church was bailing you out, or nobody was. Right. Um, Social Security, unemployment insurance, food stamps, Section 8 housing were non-existent. There wasn't even a minimum wage law. Um, it came from your neighbors. Um, compared to most families in Winfield, the Longs did pretty well. But young Huey saw a lot of poverty firsthand, and it stuck with him. When he was eight years old, one of the neighbors got so far in debt to his store that his farm was put up at auction. Jesus Christ. Huey watched as the farmer begged the auction crowd not to bid on his farm. Jeez. If you could just harvest another crop, you could pay the store back. No one in the crowd bid. Mm. The, yeah, sher- yeah. the sheriff was just about to say no sale when the creditor made a bid. Oh, oh fucking cr- Did they run him out of town? Did they uh, run him up? The creditor won the farm, leaving the farmer jobless and homeless. Huey remembered, quote, the poor farmer was out. I was horrified. I could not understand. It seemed criminal. I don't know if he talked about that. He does now. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Caledonia homeschooled her children until they reached their teens. She was a devoted Baptist with a photographic memory that Huey inherited. Oh. Uh, small for his age, Huey disliked hunting, farm work, and sports. Instead, he was a voracious reader. When a train came to town, uh, Huey crawled underneath it to see how it worked. Huh. He listened to the old-timers gripe about politics outside the general store. Um, at 13, he was baptized in a fish pond. Hey! Be- cool. Became a member of the First Baptist Church. Uh, the family and fish att- pond. the family attended church services twice a week, studied the Bible every day, and looked forward to tent gospel revivals. For the rest of his life, Ooh. he tithed ten percent of his income to the church. Wow! Of all the Protestant denominations, Southern Baptists are famously strict on conduct. Dancing and drinking are forbidden. In nineteen nineteen, when the Eighteenth Amendment was ratified and alcohol prohibition became law, the Southern Baptist Convention called it "quote the greatest victory for moral reform in America since the Declaration of Independence." <laughs> Uh, uh, emancipation of the slaves, uh, far uh, a, a distant third. Yeah, mm. finally they'll not dance with us now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just taking away people's freedoms is really what you want to do. Um, 
When he was old enough to enter school, he impressed his teachers with his photographic memory and impetuous personality. Upon completing the 11th grade, Huey was looking forward to graduating. Unfortunately, Louisiana passed a new law requiring students to finish 12th grade to graduate. Shit. Huey protested and refused to complete grade 12, meaning he never graduated. Hmm. College was unaffordable, so he left home at 17 to become a traveling salesman. Well, you know, he seems like a precocious get out uh, there. kid. Yeah, 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 get out there. He toured the South, pushing everything from patent medicines to canned foods, selling door-to-door. Food. Uh, it showed Huey how to connect with people. He learned how to dress, how to advertise, and how to use music to catch a crowd's interest. In 1910, he met a young stenographer, Rose McConnell, at a baking contest in Shreveport. He organized. Was the- she was dis- was she taking the minutes of the baking contest? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think. Strike that from the record. <laughs> yeah. No cinnamon buns. Yeah. Are admissible. Uh, he he'd organized the event to promote the lard substitute, cotyline. Cotyline is that cotton based lard? Oh God. Uh. Ju- uh, Huey was a judge, and he awarded uh, Rose and her mother the top two prizes. Which was a date with him. Hey. Ro- Rose and Huey began a romance and married in 1913. They went on to have three children, Dolly, Russell, and Palmer. Hmm. Um, sometimes the companies he worked for went under, causing him to go broke as well. He slept on park benches and, and rice bins and put his clothes up as collateral just to buy food. Oh, my God. His mother uh, suggested he stay with his older brother, George, in Oklahoma and study the Bible, becoming a preacher in the fall of 1911. He attended some lectures at Oklahoma Baptist College, but quickly changed his mind about preaching. Uh, George lent him 100 bucks so he could take law classes at the University of Oklahoma. One semester later, he was back in Louisiana selling door to door. I wonder what it was about the preaching that he just... I don't know. Um, Because it seems like based on his future trajectory, you know... It seems kind of, yeah, like I think he just liked being in the mix and... um, being able to deal with people to actually make things better mm. um, instead of just telling them how things <laughs> should be better. Yeah. Yeah. Or um, they'll be better when after you, you die. die. <laughs> yeah. Um, the economic strife in 1914 uh, sent Huey searching for a new career with the help of his older brother, Julius, a working lawyer. Huey figured out which law classes would help him pass the bar as quickly as possible. Hmm. In 1915, he and Rose moved to New Orleans where he raced through three semesters at Tulane University an examining board was convinced to allow him to take the bar early, which he easily passed. Huh. Uh, so he did not pass college, high, high school, school, or law school, but he passed the bar. Mm-hmm. Um, That's all you need. It's like that show Suits. <laughs> is it? I don't know. I don't know what the fuck that is. <laughs> Have you watched it? No, but I think it's like a guy who didn't go to law school, who like Bought a suit. knows the law, mm. passed the bar maybe. Oh, okay. So they're just yeah. ripping off Huey Long. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's always good when we reference things we all none of us know about. <laughs> that's always the best. Suits. Uh, coming suits. back, actually. It's wow. coming back to cave. Coming uh, back to streaming. On, uh, yeah. the Was on USA, I believe, and now it's going to be on your stream. Fucking knows everything about it. He's never seen it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Huey is now a lawyer. Huey and Rose moved to Winfield, where his uncle George, president of the Commercial National Bank branch, Gave him office space. His, cool. d- his desk like was a DVD a- of it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're going to love this, man. It's a really <laughs> funny movie. Real takedown of corporate uh-huh. life. Whenever you see me, that's the worst day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so his uncle gives him office space at this, at this bank. His desk is a wooden box covered by a cloth skirt that Ruth sewed. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's nice. Um, Huey was proud to say that he never took a case against a poor man. A widow was sued and slandered by the bank where his office was. And <laughs> after, after, she, after she endorsed a loan that went bad, Huey took her case against the yeah, bank no, where his uncle... Off, yeah. Uh, he worked out of a hotel room uh, because... You know the uncle was yeah. infurious. This guy's uh, the Lincoln lawyer. Was the was the the bank was like she's out of money and her cooking sucks. Yeah, she stinks too. <laughs> she smells like shit. Well, she just endorsed the loan, so it's I don't know, uh, you know, whatever. But anyway, the slander. Um, so he worked out the whole time for two months to avoid distractions. He won the case and he won the case and saved her two hundred thousand dollars, which is four point eight million dollars today. Oh my Holy god! Holy shit! Um, the bank paid Huey a $40,000 fee, which is just shy of a million today. This is a big case. Yeah, it's a huge fucking case. And she smells great. Though. Yeah, yeah. 
What do they say about this lady? I know. Slander She's laws in the, in the South. <laughs> Turn of the century. You can't slander that poor woman. <laughs> With his cash windfall, Huey and Rose moved to Shreveport in, in 1918 and built a home. He was busy at work representing small plaintiffs in cases against big businesses. He worked on a number of workers' compensation cases, which motivated him to lobby the state legislature for workers' comp reforms. The name Huey Long was becoming known in town for good reason among the middle and lower classes and for bad reasons among the upper classes. Uh-oh. That can't be good. Um, out of the forty grand from the bank case, he invested 1000 into a well. That eventually struck oil. Oh, Jesus Christ. This water tastes like shit. <laughs> uh, Pour it up. <laughs> Theoretically, worth a fortune, but John D. Rockefeller's Standard Oil had no interest in buying from that well, rendering it worthless. One Monopoly's whims made Huey's foresight and shrewd investment meaningless. He called Standard Oil, quote, an invisible empire run by, quote, petroleumites. Mm. Petroleumites. He's an anti petroleumite. Yeah. Uh, if if Huey wanted change, he'd have to forego the riches of legal work and run for office. At just 25 years old, he ran for a spot on the State Railroad Commission. Oh, that's a good spot. At every crossroads in every town across the district, Huey was making speeches and spreading bulletins attacking corporate monopolies. He attacked Standard Oil's giant pipeline monopoly and called for fairer regulation of state utilities. He messaged his, his message resonated deeply with the disaffected poor, and he won a spot on the commission. Unfortunately... As just one man with no political ties, he couldn't do anything to change Standard Oil's monopolies on pipelines. Mm -hmm. In 1921, Huey represented a small oil company in a lease dispute with Standard Oil and lost. But it wouldn't be their last fight. Yes. <laughs> in 1922, he got a promotion and became chairman of the State Railroad Commission, now renamed the Public Service Commission. The hmm. first item on the agenda was suing Cumberland Telephone Company. They jacked up their rates by 20%. Just because. Checks out. Uh, Cumberland won the case initially, but on appeal, Huey took it all the way to the Supreme Court and won. Wow. Damn. Cumberland had to pay out a settlement of $450,000, about $8.1 million today, to be distributed among 80,000 overcharged customers. Wow. Uh, the former president, William Howard Taft, who was one of the Supreme Court judges, and said, the most brilliant lawyer who ever practiced before the United States Supreme Court. Shit. Really, man. Yeah, I mean, this is a he's pretty popular guy. You'd that, say ju one judge said the same thing about that fucking um, that serial killer guy, Ted Bundy, too. So mm. I don't know. I'm not, I don't know if it holds that much weight. <laughs> it's not the Supreme Court. <laughs> okay, well, you know, the he called him partner too. Hey, partner. Man, I would love to see you, hey, partner. Uh, Practice law in my court. I like the ladies too. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not so much on the beheading and biting and mouth fucking post mortem, but I would love to see you practice law in here. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. How did you come to your decision? He just found out he was Republican and was like, "Say hey, that's a that's solid sure. ethos." Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, knowing full well that the quote old regulars would be working against him, Huey ran for governor in 1924. The strategy was as follows. Mm -hmm. In every parish, there's a boss, usually the sheriff. He has 40% of the votes. 40% are opposed to him and 20% are in-betweens. I'm going into every parish and cuss out the boss. That gives me 40% of the votes to begin with. And I will host trade them on the in-betweens. I love the in-between. <laughs> that's the meat. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the sucking the head of the crawfish. That's getting the marrow out. Getting of the in-between. Mm. I was picking the meat out the gate of teeth. <laughs> yeah. It's me and your me me and your dad both sucking toothpick. Yeah. Get up. Brush your teeth once. Yeah. <laughs> My dad had fake teeth. You could take them out and brush them. You could take them out and pick the nuggets out. Yeah. You could get a fucking dust buster on there. <laughs> Nobody knows what a dust buster is anymore. Wow. Watch Back to the Future 2 and figure it out. Yeah. Kids will love it. The campaign was a tour de force of aggression. Papers like the New Orleans Pecune were mm -hmm. unimpressed. They'd rarely seen a candidate whose statements were, quote, so shot through with gross error and, quote, so careless of truth generally. Hmm. For a man with no institutional support, Huey ran very well and came in third. Um, so that's 1924. He's 31. Damn, 31. Yeah. That's, you know, actually, unlike, you know, he's not a scoundrel. And yet. he, I mean, like, you know, we, 
the, the, the South, the good old boy system. And, you know, yeah, to be an outsider like to that. To be an outsider and yeah. do that well. And he's been the, he spends the next four years coalition building and networking amongst every group of blue-collar workers he could find. Securing the Democratic nomination in 28 meant everything. A few members of the old guard warmed to Huey when he supported Catholic candidates running in key districts. He lifted his campaign slogan, quote, every man a king, from the populist William Jennings Bryan, who said, quote, every man a king, but no one wears a crown. Over, hun- over hundreds of campaign speeches by Huey expressed a vision for a new Louisiana where the government responded to people's needs. He promised good roads, bridges, free hospital care, free education, and lower property taxes. His speeches were fiery, picturesque, and punctuated with jokes. Playing the buffoon to lighten the mood was a long specialty. Oh. Now I'm just a simple <laughs> fish king <laughs> from the, the swamp. Yeah. I'm a backwards gator guy. I never graduated from nothing. <laughs> but I do know this. Yeah. I smell shit. I know what shit smells. Yeah. <laughs> On January 17th, 1928, he won the Democratic primary election by the largest margin in state history. Whoa. Mm. The general election was even easier. Huey received 95% of the vote. What? At 34, he was and still is Louisiana's, Louisiana's youngest governor. Yeah, 34. Uh, Jesus Christ. Jesus. What have I done with my life? I've never been governor of Louisiana once. Really? Yeah. No, maybe next year. May 21st, 1928. <laughs> Ice T's born. <laughs> right out the gate, Huey fires hundreds of old guard bureaucrats and state government. Did he drain the swamp? Yeah. <laughs> he does. He's a gator. Drain the swamp. This is my swamp now. <laughs> he replaces them with young, loyal populists. Determined to fulfill his campaign promises, Huey opened the 1929 legislative session with an ambitious program of bills designed to breathe life into Louisiana's infrastructure, social services, and economy. In 1928, Louisiana only had 300 miles of paved roads Jesus. in a 52,000-mile area. <laughs> only 60 of those were cared for by the government okay okay so so whoever lived on those uh worked in the government or like paid people who did to like they were roads to the governor's mansion yeah the long administration used twenty-two thousand workers to make five thousand miles of paved and gravel roads these improvements saved travelers untold amounts of money frustration and time and safe it's safer too and it got people jobs working on the roads Mm -hmm. the airline highway from baton rouge to new orleans cut 40 miles off the journey Huey could wrap up work at the Capitol building and have his chauffeur rocket him over to the Roosevelt Hotel in New Orleans for a Ramos gin fizz in an hour flat. A Ramos gin fizz. Ooh, and who is that man? Uh, that is, uh, we'll talk about the drink later. <laughs> oh. Unofficially, a suite of the Roosevelt served as the governor's New Orleans headquarters. Occasionally, he'd be standing <laughs> buck naked <laughs> cool. in the middle of the suite during meetings with his political foot soldiers. Were they, oh yeah, they, they couldn't zoom in. They had to stare at his dick the whole time. Oh my God. Oh, so this is the Ramos. They got to stare at his dick. <laughs> yeah. This is the, the Ramos gin fizz. Uh-huh. Gin, simple syrup, heavy cream, mm. lemon juice, oh. lime juice, hmm. orange flower water, hmm. a fresh egg white, and club soda. Yeah. Heavy cream and citrus, I don't know. That sounds like an orange Julius or a creamsicle to me, my friend. Yeah. It takes the bartender 15 minutes to make it, but it's worth it. Yeah, you got to beat the egg whites. Yeah. So this is during the Prohibition era, so all the drinking that Long and his co-workers at the State House uh, had to be kept under wraps, at least a little. Um, <laughs> Until he's naked in front of you. <laughs> uh, a reporter once asked uh, Huey what he was doing to enforce Prohibition in Louisiana, and he said, Not a damn thing! <laughs> <laughs> Not a damn thing. <laughs> Good answer. Mm-hmm. Populist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking of Chris Tucker. The girl gets out of the car. And she's like, "What's up with you?" He goes, "Not a damn thing." <laughs> <laughs> looks more like Freddie Jackson. Um, said she looks like Janet Jackson. Um, his administration built 111 new bridges where there'd only been three major bridges before. Oh my god! In a state famous for waterways. Yeah, yeah, bridges are pretty important. Uh, uh, the- <laughs> For, for moving yeah, around in swamp area. <laughs> now, yeah. now think about this, like, because this is like you get a guy in and the shit starts going yeah. right away. Um, each community was guaranteed at least one public school, and every student would have free textbooks and busing. 
Wow. Holy shit. Uh, enrollment jumped by 20%. Vocational schools and night classes helped folks advance their careers, but most crucially, in a state where 25% of the adult population was illiterate. The Long Administration's literacy program taught 100,000 Louisianians uh, to read. Yeah, I mean, if you make it free, people are going to do yeah. it. What yeah. are, where was the money coming from? Yeah, that's a good I question. think it's where it ha had it been going. Uh-huh. And that was just uh, grift. Grift. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they're going to see, like, you know, there's some ways where money comes in there. You're kind of like, ah, but, like, nothing ever in his, like, after he's dead or any, like, there's nothing where you see, like, a ton of money squirreled away or anybody living high on the hog. He really was all about um, really making everybody's lives better. Yeah, uh, and if you and if you're building the roads and adding the bridges, more money gets generated, more tax revenue. Yeah, and, that, and that's, pays for itself. And, yeah, and, so, and, yeah, and it also makes the rich richer. So it, yeah. It, it's a rising tide, you know, whatever uh, lifts all boats. And stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about rising waters in Louisiana, dude. It's not cool. <laughs> Sorry, I'm very he, remorseful. He got you there, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, bro. <laughs> Don't cancel me. <laughs> <laughs> only the please. Only the Gators like it. Uh, yeah, that's this is like roads and bridges to us. Yeah. <laughs> this is Huey guys, pretty swell. <laughs> Finna get me a place in Brentwood. <laughs> Did Chris Tucker say that? Uh, state universities were offering new scholarships and lower tuition. Every department at the Louisiana State University had their facilities upgraded, and they got a new medical school and football stadium. Over eight years, LSU enrollment tripled. And became the 11th largest state university in America. Uh, Castro Carrazzo, a composer and friend of Huey's, helped him write several songs about LSU, like Darling of LSU and Touchdown for LSU, which they still play before every LSU football game. That's cool. Yeah, it's better than the, they originally wrote Fumble for LSU, and it just was not a hit. <laughs> no. no. The Board of Health tripled public health care funding. And opened 21 free clinics. Huh, that seems like a good idea. Yeah. They got the rural immunization rate up 67%. Shit. A major improvement. Uh, Louisiana expanded the charity hospital system and upgraded treatment rooms and sterilizing equipment. New laws provided dental care and more humane treatment for disabled and mentally ill people. Oh, my God. For example, the practice of chaining patients to chairs and plow stocks was outlawed. Well, you know, we still do that in the L.A. hospitals, so <laughs> not everywhere. Oh, God. Uh, hospitals for the disabled and mentally ill were upgraded and expanded. Prison inmates would also receive dental and medical care. They yeah. didn't before. God. Well, of course, John. They're in prison. They're supposed to suffer. The mortality rate in Louisiana overall declined dramatically. Oh, you, you don't say. With, yeah. With people learning to read and being immunized. Yeah, and just <laughs> getting care when they need it. <laughs> yeah, well, weird. Fuck. Huh. New Orleans got a new modern airport and a seven-mile seawall around Lake Pontchartrain. Pontchartrain. Pontchartrain? Mm-hmm. Uh, th a lot of songs about it. Oh. The new state legislature building was an Art Deco skyscraper in downtown Baton Rouge. That's the tallest, cool. The tallest yeah. building in the South. Oh, what does that say, Joseph Campbell? Um, <laughs> Huey called the old governor's mansion, quote, termite infested. <laughs> and not good enough for him, though too good for my predecessors. Oh. oh. Shots fired. <laughs> Come at me. Uh, architects modeled his new mansion after the White House. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, so for all of his good works and folksy charm, Huey was also a ruthless autocrat. Mm. Uh, okay, here we go. This is what I want. He sent the National Guard to raid, quote, immoral gambling dens and brothels in New Orleans, adding, mm. shoot without hesitation. Holy shit. What? what? Yeah, but what's the definition of immoral then? Like, Well, so this is, this is a discussion I had with, with, with Laura when this came up, and I was kind of going, is this a thing where it's still kind of Going after what he sees as uh, vice things, for, oh, yeah, and from the Baptist background, mm -hmm. um, and you know, like a single, you go like, oh, well, drinking's okay, but this other shit, no, right. you know, um, and is it also kind of aimed at? Well, it's really New Orleans elites, or, or that are doing it as a populist. It's it's, it's not a racial thing. Oh no, I don't okay. think so. Okay. No, um, uh, uh, because I, gambling and prostitution were illegal. Yeah. Okay, so. Mm. But I also think that means they weren't being taxed. I uh, also think cynically he didn't like seeing yeah, it, some money going somewhere that you know could have been going elsewhere and and you know uh any 
And also, it's something that he doesn't control. It doesn't. He, mm, he doesn't control. Right, right. In right. those places, in places that aren't controlled, can be dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Um, and somebody's got to be at the top of it, and it's probably some kind of you know criminal element that he's like A kingpin type figure. Um. <laughs> Guardsmen arrested sex workers, burned gambling equipment, and confiscated over $25,000 for the government. They burned gambling? It's like the bonfire of dice? <laughs> yeah, there's so the roulette wheels spinning around. Yeah, have, you, have, you, have you ever seen when they, 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 they used to trash pinball machines? Yeah, yeah. that's right, that's right. God, what yeah. the fuck? Was that around the, around the time they, like, that they started um, banning like certain comic books and stuff? Yeah, yeah probably, I think so. Yeah, yeah. These darn teenagers with their comic books. I know, they're all out there skateboarding on their... Big old hoverboards. Hoverboards, yeah. Um. So yeah, he 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 gets uh twenty five grand, burns the you know the gambling coin, whatever. The state attorney called uh, the state attorney general called the governor's actions illegal, but Huey replied, nobody asked him for his opinion. <laughs> well, the state attorney general. Well, I mean, I assume the newspaper. The top cop. Did. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm sure that ger- that journalist. <laughs> yeah, someone asked him for his opinion. Hey, what's your opinion on the governor's latest? <laughs> He packed local governing boards with his loyalists and fired and hired state employees on a whim. Legislators were told how to vote and promised lucrative jobs if they fell in line. Man. One legislator accused Huey of being unfamiliar with the Louisiana Constitution, and he replied, I'm the Constitution around here now! (laughs) (laughs) Yes! Great. Well, especially the way he's saying it like that, too. You know? It reminds me a lot. I'm actually reading, um, <laughs> listening to a book right now uh, on Robert Moses. Mm-hmm. Oh, wait, well, which one? Uh, Power the, Broker? Yeah. The, the Pulitzer Prize 700-page uh, one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, incredible. It's an incredible book, and it's another guy like this mm-hmm. who was, except he came from the different side of the track. He came from a, a wealthy family, went to Oxford, but was very, had this very idea of true democracy and merit and giving back in public service and, you know, did, well, I'll do it. I'll do an episode on it eventually, but did so much for New York, mm-hmm. but was also this fucking son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did, yeah, well, yeah. did, did a lot of bad things bad. Just, just because he wanted to have that power yeah, of doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's, but, I mean, that is a guy where, like, the, like when you leave a physical legacy... In New York, of things that still work, dude. Everything. It, it's kind. Of, everything in New York is Bob Moses. It's kind of yeah. fucking crazy. I think that I think that one of the blurbs I saw is like, no one moved more Earth in history. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, man. I Ever. mean, I, I mean, mean and, and you know, we'll go, we'll touch on it, but yeah, cut yeah. through, destroyed black. If you're not familiar with Robert, Robert Moses, folks, I mean, like it was like the the be- most powerful, the man. beaches, the bridges, like the parks, the roads, yeah, the, every expressway, the, hi- the, the highways, yeah, the, and and. and you know, I'm. Um, you know, you're familiar with the population insanity of New York, and and to make it cohesive and and uh, cohabitable or inhabitable, yeah, um, for everyone, he he had to really stir up some shit. Yeah. Oh yeah, and, and he had a uh, one uh, one nemesis, one uh, one hard fighting lady nemesis. I'm not there yet in the book, so oh, okay. fucking spoil it. Okay. They're all. And these they're guys, all are, they're like this. But, yeah, yeah. You know. Well, yeah. Even with the best intentions, once they start grabbing power, they they don't want to lose any of it, so they start grabbing more and more and more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a thing here too, though, where it's like you know, uh, you know, he's an asshole, but he's our asshole, right? And 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 kind of people, uh, they kind of want somebody to just kind of do the right thing, um, and those guys are kind of few and far between. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you he you do undermine. Democracy and, and things like yeah. that. You, you undermine your own cause, even if you're doing the quote unquote right thing. Once you start no. doing the quote unquote wrong things to do the right thing, right. then mm-hmm. you know. They'd... But if we believe that these institution, institutions are inheritably uh, uh, corruptible, there is a thing where you go like, "Well, who do we want to corrupt it first? Right, and in what way? But we yeah. don't. We, it doesn't have to be corrupted. Uh, I'm saying corruptible means. Maybe somebody will do it. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, I, mean, I know, I know what you mean. Yeah, right, like Tito. I'm just, right? to, like, I'm just trying to argue. Tito was an autocrat. Yeah. yeah, dictator. But he was their dictator. Right. And he he did good things for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them after after he was he was gone and communism gone like wished it was back. Right. Yeah. So. I, I, I met a, a couple of Russian kids who were like uh, around thirty. Mm-hmm. Never heard of him. Yeah. Never heard of Tito. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. That makes well, sense. Russians wouldn't have uh, acknowledged them after. Yeah, yeah it's very yeah. interesting. It's like, I, I can't explain Eastern European history to you. <laughs> I barely understood my own podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember any episode 10 minutes after we finished it. Dude, apparently, <laughs> I played this Italian song three times. And it's almost in English. <laughs> I'm beginning to hear the words now. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so any resistance was met with threats and intimidation. Mm. The governor was always wanting a peace and traveled with a crew of gangster-like armed bodyguards. Oh. Uh, they were known as uh, uh, the Cossacks or the Skull cr- cr- oh. Crushers. What? <laughs> not a good look. The Cossacks? <laughs> the Skull yeah. Crushers? Not a good look. Why not the friendly folks? The strong-armed uh, legislature passed dozens of Huey's bills in rapid succession. Now, the thing is, what are in these bills, right? Mm. Any city government that opposed them had their powers reduced. <sighs> uh, humiliating the, quote, pie-eating politicians <laughs> was Huey's favorite pastime, and he always saw himself as the people's champion. You know, interesting for a guy who judged a uh, baby contest. Yeah. <laughs> and he goes, everything I did, I had to do with one hand because I had to fight with the other hand. <laughs> I had to bring my A game. <laughs> <laughs> Training threes from downtown in double coverage. Um, and so this this goes to the heart of what we're saying here. Um, in, in his view, the, the ends always justified the means. He said, quote, they say they don't like my methods. Well, I don't like them either. I really don't like having to do things the way I do. I would much rather get up before the legislation and say, now this is a good law it's for the benefit of the people and I'd like you to vote for it for the interest of the public welfare. Only I know that laws aren't made that way. You got to fight fire with fire. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's not, he's not worried about Joe Lieberman waffling. <laughs> Joe Lieberman, good drop. <laughs> Thank you. Al Gore's running mate. <laughs> yeah, remember Jesus Christ? No, good guy. No, no, terrible man. <laughs> Awful human being. Dreadful to look at. <laughs> Just toss that in at the end. Yeah. Also, he's so a real bummer to, <laughs> to cast your gaze on. Yeah, ghoulish. Well, he's got that droopy dog look to him. Yeah. Where were you? 1929. Um, so uh, he's like uh, late 30s now? Yeah, born, uh, what? Um, it, yeah, so he'd be 36. To to make this much movement as governor that young, it's insane. Yeah. And, like, and, and the census after, like, shows, like, rapid improvement in everyone's lives in the Crazy. state. And black and white, mm-hmm. you know? Um. Huey called together a special session of the legislature and introduced a new five cent per barrel tax on refined oil. Uh, tax revenue would finance construction and social programs. Standard Oil lost their shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> In a radio address, Huey declared that any legislator who voted against the tax was bought by oil companies. <laughs> Legislators were infuriated across the board, even Huey's supporters, because it's like, oh, even if I don't like it, I'm fucking bought by oil. Um... Capitalizing on the rising resentment, Standard Oil's friends in the legislature organized an impeachment campaign. Okay. Uh, impeachment campaign for a tax that's yeah yeah well when you own when you vertically integrate yeah. oil and you can just buy also the amount of money like they were giving people in their pocket sure, oh, yeah, yeah. God. was i mean all, yeah. unfathomable well but also yeah. also as they, we, they were they were i think i i uh another one uh reading about rudolph diesel the guy who invented the diesel engine they were talking about Standard Oil and and Rockefeller and I think Standard Oil had something like ten percent of the GDP of the country. Fucking god damn it! And, and as we see even with politicians today, it doesn't take that much money to buy a bar. No, no, they're all fucking no. But the amount of money was cheap. Was was, 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 was like undeniable. Sure. So it's crazy, honestly, that this happens when you can be bought off for that much. Yeah. Um, and that you can get other people to go along with you. Mm. So the only thing you could really do is like get you a good job. Mm. But he also he also had this thing where it was like, uh, he also thought like you tithe to him. He was like, you know, I get you know, oh. you got to kick it upstairs. Uh huh. Um, but he really just used that for funding political campaigns. It right. w- it wasn't as if he would, like made a beach house, right? You know what I mean? He um, just had a White House. <laughs> but it was like it, it it was definitely like a corrupt sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It was like do what I want. Mm-hmm. Get a job. You got to kick some up to me. Everything will be better. Mm-hmm. But everything is getting better. Yeah. Uh, for everybody, including the poorest people. Mm. Um, 
So the caucus of anti-long lawmakers were called the Dynamite Squad. <laughs> they sent freshman lawmakers Cecil Morgan and Ralph Norman Bauer to introduce impeachment resolution. Out of the 19 impeachment charges, many were a joke, like blasphemy and using, quote, abusive language. <laughs> <laughs> Others were deadly serious, like misuse of state funds and subordination, or subordination of murder. Um, Wait, what? Basically saying, like, telling, telling somebody to kill somebody. Oh. Uh. Even the lieutenant governor, Paul Sear, favored impeachment, accusing Huey of being a nepotist who made corrupt deals with a Texas oil company. He asked God to forgive him for ever supporting this most cruel tyrant of all time. Please, Lord, forgive me for my transgressions. <laughs> when it came time for the House to vote on impeachment, Huey tried to close the session. Prolonged Speaker John B. Fournay called for the vote to adjourn. Most representatives ad opposed adjournment, but the electronic voting board tallied 68 ayes and 13 nays. Everyone was confused. Anti-long legislators started chanting that the machine was rigged. <laughs> They he just switched the buttons. Yeah, yeah. They ran to the speaker's chair to call for a new vote, but got physically blocked by the pro-long legislators. Uh, this sparked a brawl that would later I be imagine. called Bloody Monday in the legislature. The lesser you two, sir. Men on both sides were throwing inkwells and punching with brass knuckles. Oh! <laughs> they showed up to... <laughs> brass uh, knuckles in the legislature? I'm bringing these for the vote. <laughs> Huey's brother Earl bit a guy on the neck. Oh! <laughs> There is a long line of vampires. Yeah, in, in Louisiana? Yeah. That's, that's a Dracula. That's a Dracula country. That's a Dracula. Louisiana's Dracula country. That's Ask a, Anne Rice. Yeah. yeah. Sucker! <laughs> Sucker! Lestat! Le mm. <laughs> vote. Um, after the fighting died down, the legislature voted to remain in session and go ahead with impeachment. Dozens of witnesses gave testimony in the House, including a hula dancer who claimed that Huey had been frisky with her. Ooh, look at her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those hips. Retired boxer and long bodyguard Harry A. Battling Bozeman said, Good name. <laughs> Huey P. Long sent for me to come to the governor's mansion about five or six weeks ago. The governor said to me, Battling Bozeman, I am the Kaiser of this state. When I crack my whip, whoever dares to disobey my orders, I'll fire him. They won't last as long as me with a snowball in hell. <laughs> Shut <No>. that. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Shut that door over there, he says. Come down here and sit down by me. Now beat me up until I ejaculate. <laughs> <laughs> Make me a Huey short. The governor had been drinking. I smelled it on his breath. He said, Battle and Bozeman. I'm going to call. <laughs> he keeps calling him Battle. <laughs> oh, awesome. Listen here, Battle and Bozeman. All right, Battle He says, Battle and Bozeman, the greatest of all time, greatest yeah. box of all time. He said, sir. Yeah. <laughs> now you're one of the toughest men I've ever met. I say he is. <laughs> he says, Battle and Bozeman, I'm going to call an extra session of the legislature. And he says, this J.Y. Sanders Jr., Jared Y. Sanders Jr., state representative, leader of the long opposition, is going to disapprove of all my measures, and I want to do, do away with his ass. I says, Governor, what do you mean? He says, I mean for you to kill the blank blank. I'm going to say motherfucker. Blank blank? I says, kill the motherfucker. <laughs> Leave him in the ditch where nobody will know how or when he got there. <coughs> he goes, I'm the governor of the state, and if you were to be found out, I will give you a full pardon and many gold dollars. Many gold. Wow. <coughs> uh, Sanders was not uh, murdered. Hmm. Oh, good. He died in 1960. Well, he was battling. Uh, he was Bozeman. He wasn't a murderer in Bozeman. Yeah. Killing Bozeman. <laughs> uh, the House voted to convict on eight charges, moving the case to the Senate. With the Senate conviction, he would be out of the governorship and banned from ever holding public office in Louisiana. Holy shit. I mean, it just, and it, it did go, it did, they did convict? Uh, the, the house, no, no, you're, you're just explaining. Yeah, they moved. The, okay. Yeah, the moved. House did. Wait, so how long has, it, has he been governor at this point before they impeach him? Uh, well, he was elected 28. Um, this is 29. Jesus Christ. Yeah. But also, like, you got to think about the elites really don't like what's going on. Um, well, because he's, you know, he's also rubbing it in their faces by having his tithe, having, like, drinking, doing all the things that they would do, but he's not, he's not doing... Well, he, he's just, he's, he's just making them pay more and, um... But he's, but he's rubbing in their faces by not being the super pious guy. He's acting, he's... He, you know, he is like them in the way that he's drinking and, and open to all of the, the, the grift. Yeah. But, I, think it's, I think it's also just jealousy of power. Yeah. A yeah. lot of it. Yeah. Know? Well, yeah. And they, 
They're, everybody everybody says everything's corrupt when they're out of office and somebody else is doing it. Mm-hmm. And then when they're on the office, they're like, oh, no, we're doing everything all on the up and up. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, um, the addiction to power, I think, is the real thing. But they're, well, they're afraid of, lo- of he's becoming a, a demigod. They're afraid of losing. And also people are coming up, too. But they don't see the thing of, of the rising tide and mm-hmm. all that. Um, and maybe they don't want it. Maybe I, you have a more educated, uh, healthier, po- like. People yeah. are less desperate. They demand higher wages. They mm-hmm. they don't put up with as much shit. Like yeah, like as as we as we see we saw in, in twenty twenty three the amount of unions going on strikes. What happens is when the economy is better, unions are more likely to strike. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um and yeah, I mean and then improve the economy by doing so. Exactly. Well, that that was I guess data that was not really known back then, but it should also no, no, be I like, mean yeah, it should also be duh. If more people have money to spend, it's all going to go to you. Yeah, you know, but not. With the 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 haste, yeah. of, of not fast enough, not this quarter, pal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's the thing about like the Republican tax cuts; it's always bad. Yes, for the economy. Yeah, but, but it's it's good for a, a few people in the short term, very much. Yes, mm-hmm. a few people in the very short, a very few people mm-hmm. in the very short term, yeah. and then the rest, everybody else pays for it for a decade. Yeah, yeah. and it, also money that they don't really need because they already have so much money. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, he would be banned from, if, if it went through, uh, it would, uh, ever holding public office in, uh, in Louisiana. To drum up support, Huey held a rally in Baton Rouge and blamed the impeachment on Standard Oil. The petroleum right. monopoly couldn't stand the fact that he wanted to help the people. During a statewide speaking tour, Huey alleged that Standard Oil, every legislator, $25,000 for an impeachment vote. Enough money to burn a wet mule! <laughs> That's a great phrase. I didn't realize that was a phrase. You would try that. <laughs> it takes uh, a lot of greenbacks. That would be uh, a half a million in modern money. Um, and was he lying? Was he exaggerating about that? I don't know. Um, but I definitely believe that there was a lot of money involved mm. in uh, in in uh, yeah. opposition to this yeah. guy. Um, and and Standard Oil had had it to burn mm-hmm. back then. Boy. Yeah, all the mules were dry. Um, Huey and his 20 assistants have printed a special news sheets to protest his innocence. The headline read, Cross of Gold, Huey P. Long versus the Standard Oil. Cross of Gold. That might be the name of the, the biography on him. That's a great mm-hmm. cross of gold, which also sounds doesn't really fit with the church. But yeah. you know. A peach project was referred to the Senate, where they needed a two-thirds majority to convict. Huey stood up to speak. He presented a document signed by over a third of the senators promising a vote against impeachment because it was an illegal trial. Seeing as they'd never get the two-thirds majority required to convict, Huey's opponents stopped the trial, and he lived to govern, govern another day. It's been said that both sides brought votes with, both sides bought votes with bribes, and the senators who signed that document received favors and jobs in return. Mm. So, it, pretty good day for the senators who wanted to be bribed. <laughs> yeah. Um, he said, um, "I was elected railroad commissioner in Louisiana in 1918." And they tried to impeach me in 1920. When they failed to be impeach me in 1920, they indicted me in 1921. And when I wiggled through that, I managed uh, to become governor in 1928. They impeached me in 1929. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to wiggle. <laughs> wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. I'm a wiggler. Um, so, yeah, he's, uh, he's uh, here to... Um, it was around the time that Huey got the nickname The Kingfish. After a character on the Amos and Andy radio program, <laughs> um, impeachment bold, emboldened the governor. He told reporters, I used to try to get things done by saying please. Now I dynamite them out my path. Oh, my Jesus God. Christ. And he said it exactly like that. Just like that. <laughs> Just like that there. No more wiggling for me. Yeah. <laughs> that don't mind. Quote me verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this, this Huey Long character. This <laughs> battling Bozeman behind me. Good guy. No, he didn't. He, he, great he, guy. He snitched on yeah, him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is okay. Um, do you, uh, do you, uh, let's take a little break, and then and then we'll come back, and we'll, and we'll have a little clippy. Oh. Oh, okay. All right, we'll be right back, folks. And we're back. Oh, neat. Now, I believe uh, what we have queued up here is a little uh, a bit of uh, Huey talking about prohibition. Hot looking, man. Yeah, let's, uh, let's hear from Huey here. Okay, let's hear what Huey has to say. 
The conditions in the state of Louisiana are better than they are in any of the other states. What unemployment and distress we have in America is not due entirely to the tariff, nor to prohibition. More likely it is due to the over-concentration of wealth against which we were warned by the laws. Man, a bowler hat. Just what did Dr. Eckner say about the mooring mast on top of the Empire State Building? Well, Dr. All right, well, that's that, I guess. Okay. Uh, the technology wasn't so great. Yeah, I know. Yeah. For people to see this on their internet but back then. Talking about, you know, concentration of wealth, et cetera, and so on. Glad things we, we moved past that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not an issue <laughs> yeah. anymore. Um, uh, wait, so he was like 40 in that video? It's amazing. Just people just 70 years ago, they all yeah. look like they're fucking... Ten thousand years That's old. See, you, you can probably see with his, <laughs> you're right, his, actually, you're uh, right. you know, his face there too, which you've gotten a glimpse of. Mm -hmm. uh, the 1995 TV movie, he's played by John Goodman, and in a lot of pictures, you're like, oh my god, this guy can be played by nobody but John Goodman. Yeah, right. yeah. We have with the you got the jowls and the yeah, the yeah. chin and the yeah, um, hair and the, the face, the chin rummy. He's yeah. So you know, there was kind of a thing where. Uh, He, you know, he was kind of a, um, they called him a one-man political machine. Nice. Yeah, it sounds like it from everything we've heard. Uh, and he really, um, he really could just do so much on his own and, like, he, he just didn't stop working. You know, he was always doing something. Um, and he was, like, a true populist, you know. So he's, you know, them or, uh, uh. Is he a dem? Yeah, he's a, he's yeah, he's a, a Democrat. Dem. He says, uh, in 1930, he said, The only difference I ever found between a Democratic leadership and a Republican leadership is that one of them is skin you from the ankle up and the other from the neck down. <laughs> 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 it's a very funny, like, Will Rogers sort, yeah. of, uh, sort of thing. Uh, that's from his speech, High Papa Lorum and Low Papa Hiram. <laughs> Whatever the fuck that is. Um, Probably anti-Semitic. <laughs> Uh no, he actually uh he actually was, no. was uh uh had a lot of close Jewish friends. Oh, well, some of his best some friends. Of his best... Uh no, I mean like they're 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 close in the mix. Uh, I mean, wait in the in the mix. As far as um no, as, as far as X, as far as yeah, come on. God, this guy. His critics owned all the papers and radio stations, so Huey created the Louisiana Progress to publish articles promoting his programs. He also wrote his first book, Constitutions of the State of Louisiana, 1930. As governor, the wall chest, or the deduct box, was one of Huey's most controversial creations. <laughs> if Huey gave you a job to make a cash contribution to his campaign fund, uh, you, you had to make a cash contribution to his campaign fund if he gave you a job. <laughs> he, he kept the money locked in the deduct box. In the suite at the Roosevelt Hotel, the system made sense to Huey because he didn't take corporate bribes and he didn't have wealthy donors. These contributions paid for his travel around the state to combat negative press and to promote his bills. A historian estimated that Huey collected between 50 and 75 grand in every election cycle. Oof. Good jobs were scarce in Louisiana, so few state employees ever complained. If Long wasn't in office, they'd lose their jobs too. Historians have backed up Huey's claim that he never enriched himself with the deduct box funds. Mm. Um, in 1930, he started receiving death threats against him and his family. There was even a drive-by shooting in his New Orleans home and several arson attempts. Oh my gosh. Um... Huey's detractors in New Orleans formed their own society called the Louisiana Constitutional League. They dug up dirt on Huey and supported other potential gubernatorial candidates. Huey referred to them as the Constipational League. This man can't shit. They're full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they don't give a shit about the people. <laughs> Uh, with half of his gubernatorial term remaining, Huey announced a run for the Senate. He said the United the States Senate. Mm. The United States Senate. He said the race would be a referendum on his policies and it would strengthen his governorship. It's interesting because it seems like that might be a step down, but I guess... The United States Senate? Well, after, after being a governor. Nah, tell that to fucking uh, Mitt Romney. Sure, sure. Also, I mean, yeah, the the power you wield as, as one of... Uh, a hundred. But I guess the Senate is then you work, then the presidency. Yeah. And so yeah. On. 
Uh, and we'll also see how he handles Louisiana business as a senator. Oh, uh, okay. Um, September th- uh, 3rd, 1930, Shreveport. Sam Irby was rudely awoken by a gang of men bursting into his room at the Gardner Hotel. It was for fun? They were officers from the Louisiana Bureau of Criminal Identification. <laughs> Irby? I said, Madeline Bozeman, wake up. <laughs> Get out of my bed right next to me. <laughs> Irby's niece, Alice Lee Grosjean, worked as Huey's secretary and, according to many sources, was his mistress. After Irby lost his jobs at the Louisiana Highway Department and the Louisiana Progress, he set up a meeting with Huey's political enemies. Uh-oh. Offering testimony about corruption in the Highway Commission. Irby wasn't arrested or taken into custody. He just vanished. Oof. Rumor had it Irby had been stuck in the state prison or the Jefferson Parish Jail. Some speculated he'd just been rubbed out and dumped in a swamp. With the gator! <sighs> swamp thing! <laughs> Don't dump dead bodies in me. <laughs> or do. So he completely disappeared, and... The New Orleans Mayor T. Sam Walmsley called Irby's vanishing the most heinous public crime in Louisiana history. Irby's kidnapping t- took place less than a week before the Senate primary election. Huh. The governor along was Oof. running against a 72-year-old incumbent, Joseph Ransdell. Ransdell's age... 72? Old. Yeah. So it, he would have been born during the Civil War or some shit? Oh, yeah, before it. Oh, God. Ransdell's age and goatee were the subject of much derision <laughs> on the campaign trail. <laughs> it's, it's goatee. Long called him Old Feather Duster. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. And Old Trashy Mouth. Old trashy tra- Mouth? Old Trashy Mouth. <laughs> yeah. Old Trashy Mouth. Yeah, not New Trashy Mouth. No. You got to say old in both of them. Yeah. yeah. What's Old Feather Duster saying about me now? <laughs> old is What'd old. What did he say? Trashy Mouth. Did he hear anything coming out of his Old Trashy Mouth? <laughs> I can't hear the trash is in the way. Uh, yeah. Huh. <laughs> In response, uh, Ransdell supporters called Long a little sniveling demagogue and a blasphemer, a ruffian, and a cad, yeah. and a liar, a briber, an embezzler of the people's money, and a counterfeit Mussolini. Wow. Is that Don King? Just not as good it? as old, uh, old trash trash, trash, yeah, trash yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Huey's opponent and his enemies could have used the Irby story to sink him in the polls. Instead, Irby reappeared on September 7th. Oh, my God. And announced to the press that he'd staged his own kidnapping. Um, primary day. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, no, no. That can't be. That doesn't make any sense. No, no. Long definitely was like, are you going to fucking play ball? Yeah. And he, had- he took him out of the jail. He took him or out. Or fished him up out of the swamp and reanimated <laughs> yeah. him with lightning. Yeah, yeah, he fucking weakened to Bernie's him. Swamp thing? Right, frankly, I'm swamp. <laughs> <laughs> he staged his own kidnapping. Yeah, and he made him come out and say, I did it to, like, embarrass Huey Long. This guy, oh. this guy got abducted, has to say, no, I didn't. Mm-hmm. I did it myself. And then he's like, Mr. and then and then and like embarrass himself publicly. Mr. Long's a nice man, he's and like, I think he's very strong, yeah. and uh, he doesn't have trash in his mouth. Yeah. Um. On primary day, Long trounced incumbent Ransdell and ascended to the level of governor and senator elect. What? Yeah. Oh, because his governorship hadn't ended, or yeah, yeah he was senator elect. So once he gets sworn in, he has to yeah. give up the governorship. Yeah. Um. He left the Senate seat vacant until he could guarantee that a long loyalist would occupy the governor's mansion. Mm. 1931. Ooh. Now, you remember that the lieutenant governor said that shit about him. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Right? That's Paul Sear with CYR. Is that how you pronounce that? Yes. CYR? Yeah, Sear, yeah, sure. Um, the lieutenant governor said that Huey had vacated the governorship when he got elected to the U.S. Senate. Uh, he had himself sworn in as governor from a hotel room in Baton Rouge his new seat of government. Huey declared he had not taken the senatorial oath and was still governor of Louisiana. Kicking things up a notch, Huey called in the National Guard to secure Baton Rouge. Oh, my God. He said that Sir had vacated the role of lieutenant governor when he took that oath for the governorship. (laughs) No, you did. I didn't. You did. The case went against the state Supreme Court, and they ruled against Sear. Alvin O. King, president of the state Senate and long loyalist, replaced Sear as lieutenant governor. Wow. Now secure in his dual roles as governor and senator-elect, Long returned to pushing his agenda through the legislature. He'd shout, shut up or sit down (laughs) at any legislator who voiced concern. During one memorable evening, Huey passed 44 bills in under two hours, 
one bill every three minutes. The legislature was, as Huey joked, the finest collection of lawmakers money can buy. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's not a good joke. It, it, Jesus Christ. 40, 44 bills? Yeah. I'd like to know what some of those bills were. Yeah. The Huey Long Memorial Fund. His brother Earl was put in charge of distributing patronage appointments. Oh, to- oh good. His brother Earl. Who's been, yeah, in charge of uh, distributing patient appointments to local politicians and turning businessmen into long loyalists with state contracts. Long's allies got appointed to key government positions. As conservation commissioner, Robert Maestri purposely failed to regulate energy companies in exchange for donations to Long's campaign fund. So a little, mm. little naughty there. Oh, a little, a little naughty. Yeah. <laughs> Just so much corruption in so little time. Earl would tell the head of uh, Louisiana Highway Commission, Oscar K. Allen, which construction and supply companies he should award contracts to. Long's opponents saw these moves as charged, saw, saw these moves and charged that he'd become a tyrannical dictator. By 1931, cotton prices had dropped to all-time lows, and the U.S. had made had a major cotton surplus. Huey proposed a cotton holiday in 1932, a total ban on cotton production to drive up prices. He wired the proposal to other governors and planned to put it to a vote at the New Orleans Cotton Conference. Taking it one step further, Huey, that pick. Huey proposed that the holiday go international to protect domestic cotton prices. Some cotton-producing nations like Egypt expressed interest in the idea. Delegates from every big cotton-making state attended the 1931 New Orleans Cotton Conference. They agreed <laughs> to codify the cotton holiday into law on the caveat that the law only come into effect when three-quarters, three-fourths of the cotton-producing states pass their own bans on cotton production. Huh. Louisiana unanimously passed the legislation. Texas produced the most cotton, and their governor, the conservative Ross S. Sterling, condemned the law as radical. The Texas legislature voted down the measure, effectively killing the holiday movement. Huey summed up the loss. Texas legislators were bought to to kill the cotton holiday plan like you'd buy a slot machine. After the fact, Texas, Mississippi, and Arkansas passed laws to limit but not terminate cotton production in 1932. And so this is uh, the first kind of thing where he starts an idea, it seems radical, and then everybody agrees it's very sensible mm-hmm. later. But yeah, they also don't want to join him on it because it, yeah. it look bad for him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I just, uh, I, w- I want to wrap up part one here with a, a little thing about uh, his political views. And, um, well, I guess, uh, well, what, do you, what, do you, what do you think so far about the, the demagoguery of the Huey Long? Um, <clears throat> you know, like you, 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 sometimes you have to fight fire with fire, mm-hmm. and um, you know, you there isn't like, you know, there are some things that are objectively good, and even sometimes if you do bad things to get there, you sometimes just have to accept it. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's politics or war. Or vigilante crime fighting in a comic book <laughs> yeah, world. That was, mm. I was wondering. You know, like uh, what you know, fucking Roosevelt was president four times. Mm. Sure, I see what you're saying. And you know, when it, like in World War Two, we did a lot of we did bad things, mm-hmm. and we did good things too. Uh, but you had sometimes you have to do bad things. I'm not talking about like internment of Japanese. That's just objectively bad. Yes, sure. I just mean like sometimes you have to do bad things to 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 get, uh, you know. Well, you have to be careful if the ends justify the means. Yeah, I mean sometimes they do. Sometimes. Um, well, and, no, I mean- and, and a lot of these like things that he's doing, as I see it, um, is is getting around red tape. And yeah. and and a more entrenched corruption from more nefarious powers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, like, you're not you things things like Standard Oil or um, you know rampant corruption of the elites and and, and the revolving door of business mm-hmm. and politics. Like, you're you can't beat those things politely. Oh, yeah. Sure. You know, sometimes you really do have to fight fire with mm-hmm. fire. Um, you know, the, yeah, you, you know what I mean? Like, I do. And I think, so what I'm saying in, in, in terms of, uh, these institutions being corruptible and, and this is how this is, I mean, this is one of the ways where fascism, uh, 
gets it because people go, they can go, I know somebody's going to try to pass this thing that's good for people. And I know that other politicians are going to be bought off by some company that doesn't benefit from that and benefits from the opposite. And then they might not be able uh, to, uh, to overturn it, but they can at least delay it. And it increases this fatigue in the Democrat, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the Democratic uh, process. And people get fed up with it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So there's a thing where you go like, all right, well, if, he's, if he is being a tyrant, you know, if he's being the Batman, you know, uh, if he's uh, doing it all and it's, it's really for, uh, for, the, for the greater good. And we're, and we're going to go far uh, deeper into the greater good and his pushing for it. Uh, when he's in the Senate, um, and and how much he really pushes FDR, um, in a way that I would say part of the FDR legacy is the legacy of Hugh Long, mm. um, uh, because he was just like you're not going far enough at all with, yeah. the, with the New Deal, right, right, um, right, yes, and but so you know to get there and all that. Also, uh, on the other hand, power is just addictive. Mm-hmm. And um, and especially if you if you're righteous or if you feel that you're righteous, yeah. yeah yes. you're, well, you're not the villain. Well, and 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 you can see how that righteous belief coming up through a very religious household, mm-hmm. uh, you can see how that that would only strengthen that sort of righteousness, mm-hmm. uh, perhaps. And but when you start kidnapping, when you start, you know, it's like yeah. at some point you're making the other side's case for them. Right, but in that time, right, you know, even though they're doing the same thing, exactly. they are, it, of course, and but in more, but that in doesn't. Worse ways. But you're supposed to separate yourself from them. You're not supposed to become them with a different message. Yeah, but then you just lose. Is is kind of. The but thing. do you? Uh, uh, well, morally, no. I mean, but do you? Do you lose? I think. I think the argument is that unless I use this some of the same tools as my enemy, they're going to do. None of the good things I want to do. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and like, part of even, like, you know, the Cossacks and the Skull Crushers and all that stuff, <laughs> like, having a bit of a mob is a thing, too, where it's like, hey, don't think some Pinkertons showing up here is going to fucking sway me, pal. Right. Like, right. I got my sure. own thugs, and I, I, I also understand that a big way to motivate people is money, so I get them money. Yeah. And, sure. and um, so that's another way he's not going to be outdone. And so he's saying, okay, well, this guy is taking um, uh, bribes to dish dirt on stuff as a loyalist to me, and he could see some of, some of the, the corruption there. So, yeah, I'm going to just fucking abduct him, and then I'm, I'm not going to kill him or anything. I'm going to come out and have him embarrass himself a few days later. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, – I know what you're saying, and I kind of agree with you, but there's a part of me that goes like, well, if somebody's gonna be a gangster, isn't it good if they're kind of a ben- like a benevolent one? Like, sure, yeah, no, I, yeah, that, yeah, I know. That, that, I know, it, you know the the most efficient form of government is a benevolent dictator. Mm. But how long do they say benevolent, and how long do you tolerate a dictator? Yeah, and how long are they making the choices that right, are- right? But along the way, like you, you know, it's not as if like you see. You know the the the, the things of like you know Vince McMahon or something. You know, he's he's <laughs> not the, the he's, greasy. He, he's not having like you know. Um, the excesses of 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 graft wealth. He's not, um, you know, having a bunch of mistresses. Yeah, or he's anything. not Berlusconi. Um, <laughs> right. He might have had mistresses. Like, I whatever. mean, he pro- I mean, he's sleeping with his secretary. So, right. At, at, least, at, at least, at least, I think that's in the state constitution. I think, yeah. <laughs> uh, at, at, it, was, <laughs> it, was, it was at least alleged. It is an appointed position. So, you know, <laughs> um, but yeah, there's there's no evidence. You know, he didn't poop on her head in a threesome <laughs> and tell her to keep going. Uh, like Vince McMahon. It's Vince, Vince McMahon. Yeah. Oh God, I didn't read. Oh no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when every like every every scatological thing in WWE, you go back and you're like, oh. that fucking sicko. Yeah. Dookie, remember that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no holds, holds barred. barred. Jesus Christ. Rip em. I mean, I like that. I'm okay with rip em. Oh God. But I'm not okay with Hulk Hogan's tiny little ass. Yeah. Being paraded around the screen. Anyway, we're getting off topic here. Um. So yeah, it's uh, but oh, I wanted to say one thing about the uh, this is about the authoritarianism because it is one of the biggest charges against them. Um, throughout his tenure in office, and then senior senator of Louisiana, he was repeatedly labeled as an authoritarian and 
political usurper akin to the carpetbaggers of Louisiana's past that had no respect to the rule of law. His machine in Louisiana was accused of mass voter fraud via the usage of dummy candidates and having corrupt election vote counters in various state elections, including the 1932 U.S. Senate and gubernatorial elections and elections for the amendments to the Louisiana state constitution. Um, I'm going to skip some of the stuff that will come up in, uh, in part two. Uh, with the rise of fascism in 1930s Europe, many noted parallels to Long. U.S. General Hugh Johnson described Long as the Hitler of one of our sovereign states. Jesus Christ. Well, you know, yeah. he wasn't Hitler the Hitler yeah. Yeah. then. He American fascist regular. Lawrence Dennis described Long as... Quote, the nearest approach to a national fascist leader in the United States. Journalist Graham Graham Swing claimed that Long wished to Hitlerize America. In an effort to distance Long from communism, many socialists, such as Norman Thomas, also sought to smear Long as a fascist. Communist writer Sender Garland labeled him the personification of the fascist menace in the United States and noted that his swinging arm gestures were similar to those of Hitler. Oh, fuck. Alex Bittleman, a member of the Communist Party from New York, wrote, said... Long says he wants to do away with the concentration of wealth without doing away with capitalism. This is humbug. This is fascist demagogy. Newspaper- oh, wow, the communists are against him. Newspaper Daily Worker ran... The thing is that he was. He was what? He was not a communist. No, but well, he, right. did, he did offer a lot of social... Um, welfare programs. Yeah, social welfare programs, yeah. which is like... But ev- you ev- take what you can get, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the, the purity of... Of, of some of the exactly. communist groups, yeah. even today. The newspaper Daily Worker ran headlines such as Huey Long, Louisiana's Hitler, <laughs> is sole lawmaker. Even Long's brother Julius claimed that he was, quote, trying to be Hitler. Wow. Although often denounced by a fascist by some of his contemporaries, a number of modern historians have disagreed with these assessments. Long was not anti-Semitic, nor any more anti-communist than most politicians of the time. When asked about common comparisons between him and Adolf Hitler, um... Long replied, don't compare me with that so-and-so. <laughs> Anybody that lets his public policies be mixed up with religious prejudice is a plain goddamn fool. Good answer. And later said, commented, I don't know much about Hitler, except the last thing about the Jews. <laughs> There's never been a country to put his heel down on the Jews that ever lived afterwards. That's great. Very, yeah. good, very good answer. Um, several of Long's political and personal friends were Jews, such as Abraham Shushan and Seymour Weiss. Additionally, additionally, uh, Long didn't espouse any anti-democratic ide- ideology and had no conception of a corporate state. Arthur right. Schlesinger Jr. noted oh, that, yeah. quote, Long's political fantasies had no tensions, no conflicts, except of the most banal kind, no heroism or sacrifice, no compelling myths of class or race or nation. Right. It was really just about getting what, it done. What yeah. do you got on your plate? Yeah. I think so. What do you got on your plate? Yeah, that's, I think that's a, a, a very astute. Um, right analysis because he doesn't he's not falling into like you know the ten commandments of fascism right right about you know like the enemy is both weak, too weak and too strong yes and you know the the overwhelming nationalism and the the like you said the corporate state and yeah. the myth making and like all that bullshit involved with what real fascism yeah the corporate is. state would be anathema to this man I right. mean you know it's, it's yeah, but, but he, yeah, it's it's just he's using the tactics available to him. Yeah, to attack. He's more he's authoritarian. Yeah. Well, it's Certainly. that it is that quote at the beginning of saying when when the strong like you know force over the week somebody stays in the background and learns the lessons of demagoguery, right. and you're going like that's what he he goes like well oh that's how the game is played yeah and that farmer lost his fucking shit yeah mm-hmm. well, I'll play and, that and game he's, he's like, yeah. I'll, I'll play that game I'll just do it better yeah. right um. So this is a thing. Um, do, do you know about uh, Mussolini with the force feeding castor oil? Oh, because it's a lax. It's a it's a very painful laxative. Uh, yeah, to dissidents. No, but I don't know. That that was a thing that happened. Wait, well, did he do that? Did 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 he long do it because he called those guys constipationists? No, <laughs> no. You uh, constipated. Open up. <laughs> I only like one oil. Uh, Life magazine said of Huey P. Long who knew all the checks of dissembling demagogue, was once asked, do you think we'll ever have fascism in America? Said the kingfish, sure, only we'll call it anti-fascism. Hmm. Several other similar quotes have been created to Long, but many challenge the validity of these quotes. George Sokol- Sokolsky remembered having asked Long if he was a fascist. Fine! <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> he goes, I'm Mussolini and Hitler rolled into one. Mussolini gave him castor oil. I'll give him Tabasco. Then they'll like Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, that's great. <laughs> and he was like, <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, that is part one of uh, The Kingfish. It's pretty great. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, he's been on my list uh, for a while. Um, I, don't, I, mean, I, I, uh, think, I think Schlesinger might have written the biography. I know he's, but... Um, just a very, not I don't know if contradictory is even the right word. It's it's just authoritarian, but for a sort of left wing mm. uh, political movement, and and yeah. it's it's very interesting, especially with the, how the way it ends. And um, but to hear him go through this so young to get mm. so much power, and also to fight off all of the attempts to stop him. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's like okay, well, so he's turning the vote clock around or whatever. But mm-hmm. but also, what, what, the groups that are trying to stop him, what what are what the were they gonna, what are they and what are they going to do? Yeah. yeah, and what are the reasons they're even doing it for? Right. Blasphemy. Yeah, right. And to come, I mean, you know, with with no backers. Yeah. So that's part of it too. Is like you go like, oh, you're like the deduct box, and you're going, well, that's fucked up, and you're going like, well, otherwise it's coming from Standard Oil. Like yeah, they're those, deduct those, box. Those guys are gonna have. A far more like ruthless machine, and and one you know that I I think is quite successful later, uh, but sure. uh, but uh you know you kind of go like he's just going this is what it takes man mm-hmm. yeah and once you see he's really not putting stuff in his pocket and um well he is he is putting stuff in his pocket but he's really not no I mean he he's got like the he's got the set he's got the 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 hotel. Mm-hmm. Uh, where he's doing his business, mm-hmm. the money's going to his campaign. Yeah, like that yeah. stuff is going to his pocket. Yeah, but it's it's it. But it's really about like the travel fees, like you said, you know, and uh, you know, because then you don't want you don't want to like be seen to misallocate government funds right. and stuff. That's like another uh, crisis waiting to happen. But right. We, but oh. when you have a tithe to to your campaign for people you get jobs but for. But he also ties his stuff to the church, so he's going like, this is how it this, works. This is how it works. Sure, I understand that doesn't make it right, though. But it, is it necessary to get it done, in your opinion? If you're fighting people that have... Well, I would like to think it is, the but, but may, maybe in that situation it is. I'd like to think it isn't, but... Yeah, I think the argument that he would make is, like, this is how the game is played right. already. The game's a game. I'm just doing it for reasons that the other people playing the game don't like it. Right, right. It's, it's like the the wire, you have the briefcase, I have the shotgun. Yeah, yeah, We're both yeah. in the game. We just do it differently. Yeah, and, I mean, b- but, like, you could take all of that stuff and, and be the most cynical person, um... And like like I said, like yeah, where where did the money come from? And I'm like, where was it going? Right. So whoever was there before, right, was clearly just grafting things and 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 leaving with a fuck ton of like 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 a yeah. fucking like a South American fucking dictator. And what, you know what and I mean? what's he doing with it? He's raising the literacy rate. He's raising the immunization nice rate. Also, he's, he's raising just like like the standard of living. Yeah, and and standard and, living. So like, the average uh, Louisianian, I think, is what they call them, which is. Louisiana and anything would be easier. I think it might be Louisiana. Uh, well, are they saying it with the accent? Well, I think I they're know. called skull crushers. Well, yeah, but everybody with things things like um to register a truck, mm-hmm. twenty four dollars in that money. <laughs> oh Jesus! Christ. He got it down to three. Yeah, that makes sense. So like, when everybody else's standard of living like was going up in the rest of the states, mm-hmm. they were going down in Louisiana. Right. He also was the most Republican in that way, where he was saving everybody money because mm-hmm. he was going like, all right, but just by fixing the roads, but not having to pay for textbooks, mm-hmm. he saved the average Louisianan 10 grand a year. Shit. 10 grand a year. Man. And, um, like... You do that now, that's a fucking oh, huge deal. Yeah, but that's the thing, too, is that, like, when you see some of those vote receipts, even if he was swindled, like, they fucking loved him. Yeah, 95%. Yeah, they fucking loved him. Um, And don't forget, like, in those early ones, too, like, he hadn't even corrupted everything <laughs> yet. He really yeah. got 95% yeah. of the vote. Yeah. And it was, like, a lot because uh, he really could just... Um, he's just a good talker, man. Um, And... 
you know, um, he had some of that folksy plain speak. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, trashy mouth. Mm-hmm. But like, you also kind of. <laughs> It's like that, that American thing where, like, you know, we lionize, you know, the cowboys and stuff. So you have to kind of talk like a battler, mm-hmm. and you have to kind of make fun of yourself yeah. and all that sort of shit. And he had that in spades. Yeah. You know? Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's uh, it's fascinating because I, I, I didn't – you don't ever think you're going to like any Southern Democrat governor in that time right. exploiting – uh, the good old boy system and being like on their side. Mm-hmm, but sure. um, I look at it and I go like, damn, man, like shit. what more could you hope for? Right. Yeah, like, right. Yeah. yeah. How, how has there not been another version? Of yeah. And in the black community, all of those things that literacy and, and everything, like it specifically affected them uh, to the tune of like, you know, like 60% of like, you know, it, it, it was, it was, uh, it was wild. Um, but you know we got got a lot more to chew on on, on the on the next yes yes and yes. uh and we'll get in on onto the national stage and a little bit more of the international stage and um we'll continue the, the conversation I'm for one excited uh, fantastic I'll, I'm delighted I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you you did this uh oh what are the, what are those uh, sources um well do you want me to do them all at the end of the second episode oh, or do do them now just uh you can do them again just you know let's see give the people that do. Encyclopedia. We we'll put on my spectacles here. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, we come from uh, Wikipedia with the Panic of 1893. The Daily Beast uh, had an uh, article about the uh, the history of the uh, insane asylums in in Louisiana. The, the New Yorker, um, the Long Legacy Project. Uh, the biography from Britannica on Huey Long, and um, the Daily J Store. Huey Long, a fiery populist who wants to share the wealth. Time Magazine, the Huey Long anniversary, and Politico. Uh, Governor Huey Long impeached in Louisiana in 1929, and uh, that's it. We'll have we'll, we'll have some more uh, clip clip uh, uh, references next time. Fantastic. Lovely. Thanks, Laura. Great job, Laura. Yes, mm-hmm. excellent job, Laura. Thank you so much. Uh, fellas, let's wrap it up. I'm going to say goodnight. My name is John Fahey. I love you. I'm Aaron Pita. Matt Brousseau. Good night, everybody. We love you. Thanks.